this morning, Pastor was talking about the mission of our church. And uh, if you know anything about corporations or anything like that, every organization has what they call a mission statement, the, the reason why they exist, what they hope to accomplish. Our church's mission statement is to restore people to God and to build bridges in the community. Now, that sounds really good, but the problem is, is that those things don't come easily. They don't come naturally. It's not natural. It's not a natural process to try to build bridges in the community. It, it's easier and more natural to divide ourselves from people in the community. That's a natural thing that happens. Like people who leave their ringers on and people who don't leave their ringers on. You know, I, <laughs> joking, joking, joking. Uh, <laughs> There's just a natural tendency in us to separate ourselves from others and to get offended and to see other people as, well, that's just not how I'm going to do it, and to, to divide ourselves from one each other. And then the other part of that, restoring people to God, that's not a natural process. We are naturally very self-oriented people. And so we've been talking about, how, uh, about a change of plans, how God changes our plans. We've looked at it for three, three weeks now. This is the fourth and final night of this. And... I want you to get the idea that the majority of times God changes our plans because we wouldn't naturally go God's way in things. We would naturally just kind of gravitate to ourselves and what's, what's funnest. You know what I mean? Um, you know, like I used to play video games all the time. I mean, that's fine. Video games are fine. But I played an unhealthy amount, like all day, every day kind of situation. That's, that's not good. See you know what I mean? To revolve your life that much around yourself is not a good thing. And so God brings by these, these situations in our lives that cause us to reevaluate our lives. And it causes us to change our course. We talked about how sometimes it's painful things, sometimes it's shameful things. By the way, God has a way of bringing by things in life that, that change our plans. And it's in that rut that I bring up road construction. You know, I hate road construction. I don't think there's a person alive who, who thinks, yes, I love road construction. But I have been all over the southern, western, and eastern United States and the northeastern United States, and I have never been anywhere, never been anywhere that has as much construction as New Mexico. I think that New Mexico just likes to irritate people. They're like, we're going to have people traveling through, and we don't much like Texans, so we're going to put up some road construction. That'll irritate them. I, I think this might be their thought process. And, uh, but one thing I hate more so than road construction is potholes. Do you see, the, do you see the, the conundrum there? They have the road construction to fit the bot fix the potholes. I don't like the potholes, but I don't like the road construction. Well, you have to pick one, you know. Uh, <laughs> but what's even worse than the potholes and the road construction it is when I'm driving somewhere unfamiliar. And there's a detour, but it's poorly marked. Have you ever done that? It's a place that you're not used to. Like one time I was doing, driving through Carrizoza. It was a poorly marked detour. Not a big deal, because I mean, Carrizoza, I mean, anywhere you go, you're going to be out of the town in about five seconds. Not that big of a deal. But um, then this last week, I was in El Paso, and they had a poorly marked detour. That was very frustrating. And, uh, you know, you, you've all been there when you're driving somewhere, maybe on a road trip, and you, and you pull into a town, and you're like, why have they done this? Um, one time they said, detour, turn right. I turn right, and then I keep going straight for miles, and there's never another sign. So I'm like, uh, I think I missed something somewhere. And, uh, but <laughs> actually, I think it might have been in Dallas. Dallas is just crazy. Uh, you know, I plan my trips, and I don't want to compensate for surprises. I know where I want to get to. I know some people just get in the car and drive. I don't. I plan out my route. I look at the map, and I literally memorize the map before I go anywhere. So if I ever get lost in a town, I have my north-south bearing, and I remember what the map looks like. I know how to get out of anywhere they get, get lost at. I used to take these survival classes, and that's where I learned that stuff. So I, I'm, I'm very, very familiar with this. But then when they have detours that get you all turned around, you're like, whoa, okay, hold on. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Let me backtrack in my mind here, and your cars are honking, and you're like, hold on, I'm almost there, let me think. But, you know, sometimes God does this exact same thing. Sometimes God send us, sends us on these detours because there's little potholes in our lives. And so God sends us on these detours that we don't like taking. And then sometimes, even more frustrating than that, 
God actually changes the destination too. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. We're going somewhere and God's like, well, that's the wrong place. So I'm actually just going to alter your course. Have you ever been, uh, you know, where, where you have the GPS and it says, turn left in 40 feet. Turn left in 39 feet. And turn left in 38 feet. And then there's this moment in some of them where it says, you have missed your turn. Proceed to. And it's like, what? We, we, you do know where I'm going, right, GPS? Like the GPS I had, um, I looked up the, 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 the directions on Bing and it actually sent me the wrong way on a one-way street. I got there, and I'm like, okay, I remember this. I memorized my route. I turn left here. I turn on my blinker, and the car behind me is all honking and waving me. No, don't go that way. I'm like, they don't know where I'm going. So I turn, and I'm like, oh, it's a one-way. Keep turning. <laughs> and it just turned it into a U-turn. I, I meant to do that. I, I meant to do that. And uh, you know, I realized why she was honking. Have you guys ever seen planes, trains, and automobiles? You're going the wrong way. How do they know where I'm going? So sometimes God sends us on, on these detours, and sometimes he actually changes the, the, the destination that we're heading towards. And there was a prophet in the Bible who complained about life's potholes, much like I just did, and then complained about God's detour. He complained about the construction, but he complained about the, the, uh, the potholes too. And uh, before you say, well, hold on, that's not in the Bible, just hold on, hold on. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 through 4 says this, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Translation, there's a whole bunch of people doing some bad things. So then in, uh, God answers him, and in verse 6 and th 7 specifically, he says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, this is God speaking to the prophet, um, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. So they don't even, they're, not even, they're not even a governed people. Well, that doesn't sound too good. So here we have the prophet kind of gives a little bit of a response to God, like, uh, did you mean that, God? Um, oh, I'm sorry, That's I wanted to include 9-2. They all come for violence, all their faces for, they gather captives like sand. That's still God speaking. Now we get to the prophet responding. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallow up the man more righteous than he? God, are, are you sure that you're planning this one out correctly? So basically, God, what you're saying is, I'm saying that there's these bad people that you're not doing anything about. And your response is that you're bringing up worse people to take care of the bad people. God, I don't understand the connect here. I, I don't get what's happening. And so here we have Israel, which is the prophet that, 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 which is the nation that this prophet is talking about in the first verse here in verses 2 through 4, when he says about these evil people who are rising up. He's talking about the nation of Israel. So here we have Israel being immoral, and that, that's, that's the pothole. That's the pothole that the prophet's trying to talk about. But then we have God saying, okay, I'm going to raise up an enemy called the Babylonians or Chaldeans here. That's the detour. I'm raising up the Chaldeans. That's a detour. He's like, okay, God, I didn't like the potholes, but now you want me to take me on this, on this detour. I'm not liking that either. Can we have this without the road construction? Can we, have a, can we fix the road, fix the issue without the road construction? That would be great. And Because I, I have these plans, God. I, I know how you're going to do this. I know how you're going to fix this. And that's not how you're going to do it. Well, the prophet was in for a little bit of a rude awakening. See, Israel was immoral. But Babylon was amoral. Do you know what the difference is? Immoral is where you know what's right and wrong and you don't do it. Amoral is where you have no sense of right and wrong. Babylon was an amoral nation. So God raised up the amoral to punish the immoral. And that just didn't seem like a good thing. I, I, I don't get the connect there, God, how you can possibly use a wicked people to bring justice. That's just, that doesn't make sense. That's not how we do things. Um, I think he would be surprised if you were to go to court and see how the lawyers are nowadays. Because <laughs> I think that is how we do things. <laughs> um, but anyways, these people were worse than Israel. 
They did things like kill children. They did things like splitted people apart. They were blasphemous. They, they used to do this thing, and they have a lot of reliefs commemorating them. They would actually draw pictures commemorating doing this. How creepy is that? They would do this thing where they got these poles and stuck them into the ground and then impaled people on them, and uh, let's hope you were dead. If not, you were going to sit there and struggle for a little bit until you were dead, and then they just leave your body out there. These are not nice people. These are the people that you get afraid of them even coming around. This is bad news bearers. And yet those are the people, those are the people who God, who God brings by. It, you could say this is definitely a change of plans. Israel would be destroyed by this evil people and there was nothing the prophet could do. God wasn't asking the prophet's opinion. He was simply telling him, this is what's going to happen. And there was nothing that this prophet could do to prevent it. Imagine that. In fact, there's another prophet, Jeremiah, who, taught, who, who is going to do this thing, and God says, I want you to tell them this. They're not going to listen. Then I'm going to punish them for not listening. And God says, are you already tired from just this little bit? Because there's a whole lot more coming here in the future. You, <laughs> buckle down, buddy. This is, this is going to get worse than this. And uh, so you see a very similar situation going on there. Don't you kind of wish with the frustrating situations that come by that there was just a magical thing that you could do and fix it? Just like that. Wouldn't that be great? Like the, you ever seen those commercials with the red button where they push it and they get a redo? That would be nice. I want one of those buttons for my house. What I would like to do is I would like a time machine where I could try out every single course of action and see which one is the best. Have you ever wanted to do that? Like, okay, I did this and that blew up in my face. If I could just go back and try this other option. If you, if you, if you, for those of you who have ever played games like Skyrim or Fallout, I do this on those games. I save, do a quick save, and then I try this. And I'm like, oh, that turned out terribly. I'm not going to do that that way. And then I just reload a save. Life is in a video game. You don't get to do that. You just have to play through. It's like playing golf, but you keep hitting the ball into the sand, and you're like, how do I get out of the sand? <laughs> And then we have this idea that God, God wouldn't possibly put us in a bad situation. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Most of you guys are already getting, no, that's just not how that works. God never said we won't go through it, but that he would guide us through it. Think of it like a plane. The plane is going to arrive at your destination. But there might be turbulence on the way. <laughs> and that's exactly how it oftentimes is with God. You know, God, you weren't supposed to let these bad things happen. And, uh, well, <laughs> God has a way of just bringing by things that we didn't think. Sometimes it's death. Sometimes it's finances. Sometimes it's disease or pain. Sometimes it's heartache. We really don't know what God's going to use. But we do know that sometimes <laughs> bad things are going to happen. Um, and I think that this picture really is, is really goes along great with what we're talking about here. Kind of summarizes what I'm gonna what I'm about to say. Happy moments, praise God. Difficult moments, seek God. Quiet moments, worship God. Painful moments, trust God. And every moment, thank God. See, sometimes we think that we can worship God as long as things are going good. But if God changes our plans, if God causes something to come by that we don't want to happen, well, that gives us the right to resent God for it because it's not fair. See what I mean? And sometimes things aren't fair, but that doesn't give us the right to oppose God in his direction. In one part, the prophet's, uh, the prophet's talking to God, and God says, how silly it is for someone, if a potter is forming a piece of clay, how silly would it be for that clay to tell the potter, hey, you're doing this wrong. Like, I, I mean, the, the, that's just not how things, deaf things do. The, the potter makes it for whatever purpose he has. And that is difficult for us to deal with because that means that we're not the boss. And deep inside, we all want to be the boss. One thing that we see, though, um, especially with this, with this book in Habakkuk, or this, this passage in Habakkuk, I should say, it is more important that we handle situations well than that life is fair. 
it is more important how we handle things than what actually happens. God, it is unfair that you allowed this to happen. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? God, it's unfair that there's so many kids that don't have a home. Okay, what are you going to do about it? See what I mean? We can sit around and complain about it and whine about the situations, or we can say, God, how can you use me in this situation? What, what can I do that, that, you can, that you can work through me? And see, that's difficult because that, once again, means that our plans are going to get changed. Sometimes we have to forgive those who aren't sorry. Sometimes we have to do good things even when people falsely accuse us. In fact, I believe it was Mother Teresa who said, you know, people are going to they're gonna talk about you. They're going to question your motives. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to do all these things. Do it anyways because it's, you're not doing it for them. It wasn't between you and them. It was between you and God. So you just do it anyways. And I think that Mother Teresa is a, a pretty good voice to listen to, I would say. Gave up her entire life for other people. I think that's a pretty good role model. Um, you know, and we as parents oftentimes focus on trying to make sure our kids never experience anything unfair. We waste a lot of effort. <laughs> First off, that's how they get character. L- think back on your own life, and how many times did you go through impossible situations, and then God brought you through, and it made you who you are? It's to the point that through all the bull crap I've gone through, I wouldn't trade any of it for the whole world. Because I don't want a fair life. I want a wonderful life. I don't want a shallow life. I want a purposeful and meaningful life. See the difference? And I think that we've sometimes lost that, um, especially with, with we're, we're, taught, we're taught when we're told and we're led to believe that we have to always watch out for ourselves and live life for ourselves. That's a very, very shallow, very shallow life. I mean, it, it's it's... It's fun when you're a kid, you know, but then when you get into your 20s and then into your 30s, you're like, this isn't as fun. This, this is not as fun. And eventually you get to the point of just getting lost and you don't really know what to do with yourself. But going back to the whole parent things, we, we as parents are tasked to teach our kids through the struggle, just like God does. We're not tasked to keep them from ever experience any, experiencing anything unfair, but to teach them through the unfairness. You know what I mean? For instance, your kid is bullied, bullied at school. It is very easy to go in there and, and threaten the kid or to yell at the parents or something like that. It's very easy to teach your kid to go and beat the crap out of them. It's a lot harder to teach them dignity and grace and poise and allowing yourself to be wronged. That's a lot harder to teach because it's not fair. And we don't want our kids to ever experience something like that. It's a very difficult thing to say, this is going to work out for for the best. And I'm not saying you shouldn't step up to take care of things that need to be done, but sometimes we focus so much on trying to undo unfair situations. It's not fair that our kids or our grandkids or our relatives or our siblings are going through this unfair situation. Yeah, but you can't change what is. You can only act according to what is. There's a big difference there. You can never erase somebody's past because it was unfair. You can act in such a way that will help them. Hard times will always come, but be there when they do. Because when they're adults, you either can't or won't be there, either or. And that will, some of that will be your choice, some of that will be their choice, some of that is just the way life goes. You don't have to toughen them up. And I see I, people go to the other extreme and say, well, I, you know, I want to toughen them up for life. Life will toughen them up. You don't have to worry about toughening up kids. Trust me, with all this stuff going on in this world, they'll get there themselves. What they really need is someone who loves and encourages them. That's, that's what kids really need. And also, and I'm learning this more and more, you, you can't give up on someone You can't give up on people. You have to train, you have to teach, you have to support, but then after all these things, you have to let them go. We, I I see, I see parents trying to still baby their thirty, forty, fifty-year-old kids. You have to cut the umbilical cord and let them learn how to struggle. 
let them learn how to grow from the struggle. There comes a point where they are, they are a full-grown adult. You have to let them go. They have to learn how to make those decisions for themselves. Babying them will not do anything. It won't. You can't always be there to bail them out of jail. You can't always be there to give them a free place to live. You, 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 you can't do that. You have to let them discover how to be a man and how to be a woman by themselves. See what I mean? And that's difficult because we as parents like to fix everything. And I'm not just talking about parenting here. I'm talking about everything. This applies to work. It applies to, to your, your, your marriage. It applies to, obviously, to kids. It applies to, to your relationship with, with everyone. It, that's just, you can't remove hard times from coming. So let's tie all these things together. So God changes our plans, yes, but here's, here's the key to all these different things we've been talking about with God, cha- and God changing plans. He's always working. See, Habakkuk didn't get this. The, the prophet that we were looking at at the beginning, he didn't get this. God, how can you possibly be in this? This is a mess. How can you possibly have anything to do with this? He didn't understand that God is always working through the bad things and the good things. Now, let me give you a few situations, okay? He can use unjust situations to bring justice. He can bring evil people to bring good. He can use people we look down on and despise to accomplish his goal. He can use politicians that we don't like and that we didn't vote for. That's a difficult thing. We think we are playing chess, you know, and we're so, so many moves ahead, we've got it all figured out. But then Satan comes by and he pulls a fast one and we think, oh man, it's all lost. And we even make it a thing about, man, I better pray the perfect prayer. But the truth is that God is always working and he is way ahead. If it is a game of chess, he's already got the last play figured out. Instead, we kind of make it a thing where we have to have it all fixed and resolved ourselves. But he knew it before it ever happened. Should we trust our own logic and wisdom, or should we trust God through it? See, it's not going to come natural to trust God. We're going to naturally come up with ideas of how to fix everything, but it'll work out better if we trust God in the end. He brings purpose to terrible and chaotic situations. We can't do that. He brings beauty from ashes. We can't do that. We can make ashes. We can roll in the ashes. We can cover our head in ashes, but we can't make beauty from ashes. Have you, ever tried, have you ever tried to pick up ashes? They're thinner than they look, aren't they? You go to touch the ashes, and it's like real weird because they look like they're this thick, and then you go to touch them, and like they, they do this little smoosh thing, and then they blow away. Have you ever seen that? For those of you who have burned fires, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who have never, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, our job is to trust God even on life's detours and even when he changes our destination. Our trust, now get this, we, we talked about the mission of the church, to restore people to God, okay? That, that's kind of a big thing there all by itself, but then also to build bridges in the community. Our trust of God will become someone else's inspiration. Yes, I, I, I want to restore people to God. I, I, I want to do this. I want to build bridges in the community. That's only going to come through these little detours that God brings by, through these changes of... Because we don't like to do things that way. We were reading in the passage this morning in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 5, and pastor was talking about this, and one of the things it it, it talked about was you have to put forth effort to be of the same mind. Look at us. What do we really have in common? We're different ages. We're different heights. We're different ethnicities, different backgrounds, yet we're all here for one purpose, to build bridges in the community and restore people to God. Do you know what I mean? That, that effort, that conscious effort. And as we go through these struggles and as we go through these things, our trust in God through these situations will become someone else's inspiration. It may be scary and it may be painful, but when God changes our plans, you can always trust that he will be there every step of the way. Changes will come. God, God, will send us on, God will send us on things that we didn't expect, and he'll even change the direction we're heading. Scary times will happen. 
I can't promise you that everything is going to always work out. I, I can't do that. One day, the people that you love are there. The next day, they're gone. One day, you have this great job. The next day, you're fired. One day, things happen. I can't foresee any of that, neither can you. But what we can be assured of is that we can trust in God through all of it, through the, through the lack of finances, through the physical hardships, through the emotional and, and relational hardships. God always has a way of taking these chaotic events and giving them purpose. So it may be scary and it might be painful, but when God changes our plans, you can always trust that he will be there every step of the way. Lord, we pray that, we pray that you would help us to trust you um, as we go through these scary things in life, these little detours. We, we like to complain about the potholes, God, but then we get mad at you when you try and fix them. Help us to submit ourselves to you as, as you bring by frustrating people and frustrating situations and, and just hard times that we would learn how to, how to go down the detours and how to, how to let you change the direction of our lives. Help us not to resent you as you do your work and help us to always trust you, Lord. We know that you're good and everything that you do is good. Help us not to resent you for the struggles that we've gone through and help us to forgive those who have hand, had a hand in the struggles that we've gone through. Lord, when possible, help us to do justice and when not possible, help us help us to do well. We love you. Amen. I want to encourage you.